Let's give the Lord a big hand clap. <laughs> Children's church and nursery, go on out and have a grand time. It's all good, amen. We're glad you're here. If you would open your Bibles to 2 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles chapter 15. This morning, we're so glad you're here. And again, we want to welcome our guest and make yourself right at home. You know Jesus, you're among family. And if you don't, you're still among friends. This is a safe place. And we want to encourage a believer. We want to encourage those who know Jesus and the pardon and forgiveness of sin. And we want to encourage those who don't have that relationship, that personal relationship with Christ, to come to him and because he, he, he wants you to come to him. And he will receive you, forgive you, and save you if you'll come to him on his terms. I'm telling you, it's true. It is true. Well, we're going to look at Israel this morning. And boy, and how it parallels with any nation. But I think it really parallels especially America. America, America, my goodness, America. How far you've come from whence you started. And uh, be encouraged, friend, if, we will, if we'll just do what's right before the Lord, the Lord will be the Lord. I'm telling you. In 2 Chronicles chapter, uh, chapter 15, did I say 16? I meant 15 if I did. Um, and, and on your own time, you need to go back and start about 14.2 and catch up with what's going on with uh, Asa, the king of Judah. And uh, we, we'll pick it up in verse 1 of 2 Chronicles 15. I think I told you 16, and I was incorrect. Yeah, 15, 15. Now the Spirit of God came upon Azariah, the son of Oded. And he went out to meet Asa and said to him, Hear me, Asa, and all Judah and Benjamin. Now it's the southern kingdom. You know, they've already divided. You know, they ha they've had their split. And uh, the ten tribes went, went to the north and to remain loyal uh, to God's purpose and plan. And so the, the word says, the Lord, and it's all caps there, so you know in the Hebrew they're saying Yahweh. The Lord is with you while you're with him. If you seek him, you will... Uh, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, if you back off, if you turn your back on him, watch out. He'll let it happen. And you'll feel as if that's exactly what he's doing. For a long time, Israel has been without the true God and without a teaching priest and without the law. And when in their trouble they turned to the Lord God of Israel and sought him, he was found of them. And in those times there was no peace to no one who went out, nor to the one who came in. But great turmoil was on the inhabitants of the land. So nation was destroyed by nation, city by city, for God troubled them with every adversity. But you... Be strong and do not let your hands be weak, for your work shall be rewarded. Asa was a man who God had gotten a hold of. Israel had turned from the law of God. They did not follow the instruction of God. The Bible says there was no teaching priest. There was no instructing priest that would teach them and show them the ways of God. I pray to God he'll continue to raise up men and women that will proclaim the truth. That will stand with the truth. But here, King Asa, the reforms are starting. And he realizes we've turned our back on God. We can look around at the nations all around us. Just as America, we can look at Europe and look what's happening. They're bankrupt. They're, they're, for years, since World War II, country after country after country has embraced a system that's anti-biblical. 
and said, let's just all put it together and, and we'll spread it around and everybody will be fat and happy. But all it does is make everybody poor. It makes everybody poor spiritually and it makes everybody poor financially. And now they're at the tipping point where they're ready to go off a cliff. And if it wasn't for the, the greatest economy uh, in Europe uh, upholding the rest of Europe, and that's Germany, they would be in greater calamity than they are today. And then we can look right here at home and we're at a cliff. We are at the precipice. We are at the edge. I would to God that we, God, we need a leader that will reverence you. We need a leader that will reverence you. I don't care what color they are. Don't care how, I don't care anything. They can have brown eyes, blue eyes, green eyes, black hair, brown hair, blonde hair, red hair. It doesn't make a hoot or holler. Give me someone that will reverence you. That should be every church's desire, the people who fill their pulpit and their spiritual leadership. God, give us, give us people who will honor you, that will put you first and honor you and come in compliance and understand, Lord, that you have a divine order of things and unity and harmony is paramount if we're going to move ahead. America needs unity, and I'm telling you where unity will be found, at the feet of Jesus. That's where we're going to find it. Oh, God, give us a leader that will reverence you. Judah got a leader that would reverence God. He turned to God and realized. He looked around. He surveyed the situation. Nations all around them, city-states all around them. They were in turmoil. They were in fight. They were, it was a mess. It was a mess. Look at North Africa and the Middle East. It's chaos. Open our eyes, Lord. Open our eyes and to see that, Lord, our answer, uh, thank God, thank God for our nation, our constitution, our military. I thank God for all those things. But I'm telling you, our answer has got to be found at the feet of Jesus. Listen, unless he builds a house, those who labor, labor in vain. God, give us a leader that will reverence you. Be it in our business. Be it in our workplace. Be it in our homes, moms and dads, give us a leader that will reverence you. That's what we need, folks. It's not a Democrat answer or a Republican answer. I'm telling you, it's a Jesus answer. God, give us, give us leaders that will reverence you. He says, uh, nation was destroyed by nation, and I'm telling you, it's going to get a lot worse before it gets better for those who don't know God. But I'm telling you, in the midst of adversity for those of us who know God, I don't know what next year holds. I don't know what the next five years hold. I don't know if there will be soup lines and bread lines or if it will be a prosperity and abundance. But it makes no difference. Did you hear me? It makes no difference. Our God reigns and those who say, I will follow the Lord, he will sustain us and he will bless us. And he'll use those who want to be usable. Isn't that where he wants to bring us to? To a place of usability? And, and for, that play, for us to get to that place of usability, guess what? There's got to be a place of availability. God help us. Then we see here, he says, uh, and when Asa heard these words and the prophecy of Oded, the prophet, he took courage, he took courage and removed the abominable idols from all the land of Judah and Benjamin and from the cities which had taken, uh, he had taken in the mountains of Ephraim and he restored the altar of the Lord that was before the vestibule of the Lord. Then he gathered all Judah and Benjamin and those who dwelt with them from Ephraim and Manasseh and Simeon. These are some of the rebels that have come back home. Isn't it great when a rebel comes back home? Isn't it great when, when repentance and realize this is a fool's way, I'm going to go God's way. And, and they, started, they started seeing the light. Praise the Lord. They saw the light. <laughs> Hadn't thought of that song in a long time. And he said, uh, came, came over to him in great numbers from Israel, Israel, the northern kingdom. When they saw the Lord, his God was with him. I'm telling you, friends, I, I'm telling you, we, we, your home, 
your place of employment or your place of business, your, your, your school system, our county, our city, our state, and our nation needs leaders that will reverence God. And we need, we need leaders who will respect the authority and the absolute truth of God. I'm amazed at how the church is so infected with this thing called situational ethics. I'm telling you that is sin. That's not from heaven. That's from hell. Right is right and wrong is wrong. You know? And, and if it's clear in Scripture, it needs to be clear in your heart. I know there's some great things and some things that's up for a... Listen, don't let your personal opinion and your personal preference blind you from the absolute truth. Walk in the truth. All these minor things, you know, there's enough grace to go around. And if there isn't, you need to get your heart right with God. God help us to realize that every hill's not worth fighting on, but there are some hills worth dying on. There are. There are some hills worth dying on. And oh God, he started tearing down the places of idols. Now I'm telling you, we've got all kinds of idols in our lives and we are blind to it. We, we are oblivious to it. And we think, well, that's, that's okay. That's all right. I'm telling you anything in your life, say anything. Anything in your life that keeps you consistently and in a repetitive way from God's word, God's people, God's worship, God's house, God's way is sin. It's an idol. It is an idol. I'm telling you. I am telling you. Open our eyes, Lord, and realize you know, uh, we have bought into this Western thinking that we think, well, now, okay, uh, my goal is to be as comfortable as can be. Now, that's my flesh talking. I want to be as comfortable as I can be. And now, don't misunderstand me. If God's blessed you, however much, no, not if, he has. He has. I don't care who you are. He has blessed you. And whatever level of blessing that you are allowed to dwell in, you praise God for it. But realize that his blessings are given you, are entrusted to you to advance his kingdom. Yeah, it doesn't mean you can't have a nice car or a nice place to live. You know, it can't mean that, that, that there's times that you can have moments of, of personal enjoyment. You know, Jesus got away. He went to the mountains. And as often as he could, he went by himself. See, Jesus was a mountaineer, but we won't get into that. Thank you, Jesus. But anyway, because every time they went down to the beach, there was trouble. That's a whole other story. And you people down along the coast, I love you. And, and so just know that God gives you, blesses you, your place of influence, your place of employment, your place of living, your place of life experience, and, and whatever good stuff he's allowed you to accumulate, be it a little or a lot, know that it is from him. And he has given it to you to advance his kingdom. And there's many, many ways to do that. And I'm not going to give you the laundry list of the 17,861 ways. And there's probably more than that. I'm just telling you, keep your focus on him and his purpose. And because here's what the devil does. The blessings of God can so quickly turn into an idol. I mean, you know, your, your, your spouse, your children, your grandchildren, your parents, your employment, your stuff... 
And that is a very dangerous place to be because then you'll not see the Lord as the, the blesser. You'll just see him as the conduit of blessing. And that's idolatry. That is idolatry. Oh, Lord, I want all, oh you know, and I get, I get some blooming. Uh, there's some, you know, I just, I can almost speak French sometimes when I, when I watch some of these jack legs on TV saying, I feel $58, bless God, and, and you you know, or $582.33. And now God told me to tell you to give that and you'll get this back. That's amazing to me. I'm just telling you, that's amazing to me. If that's so good, then tell me what stock to buy. You know what that is? That's just a psychic network dressed up in a Jesus garment. And I'm telling that God wants to bless you. God, God does. And I believe God wants to prosper you. But I'm telling you, be careful. Follow the Spirit of God. Coupled with the Word of God, neither will contradict the other. Amen. I know it's quiet. Bless your heart. I love you anyway. Let's move on. So they gathered together at Jerusalem in the third month, 15th year, in the reign of Asa. And they offered to the Lord at the time 700 bulls and 7,000 sheep from the spoil that they had brought. They entered into a covenant to seek the Lord God of their fathers and all their heart and with all their soul. Now, America... As a whole, is a very Americans. We're selfish. We are. You know, I'm talking about all. You know, all three three hundred thirty million of us. I'm not talking about the Lord's people per se, but you know, the Lord's people are not a majority in this place. But I'm talking about the three hundred thirty million Americans. It's so easy to center everything around instead of God around me. And here in the passage, we see the king and the people of God making a decision, realizing that all the manifold blessings that he had given them, because, you see, the Lord had a special place for them in his heart. I want you to know if you're born again, God has a special place for, of you in his heart. And what did they do? They gathered together. Oh, you're not going to like it, but I'm going to tell you anyway. And they made a tremendous, overwhelming, beyond the pale, sacrificial gift unto God. Oh, now, you're meddling now, preacher. You're getting my pocketbook. You're getting, in my, you're getting in my stuff now. But you see, these people saw their sin as God saw it. They saw their self-centeredness as God saw it. They saw the wasted years, the wasted time, the wasted effort as the Lord saw it. And you know what happens when a child of God honestly sees their sin before God? You know what will happen? They'll repent and turn. That's what they'll do. And what is the evidence of it? Well, under, under this economy, it was an offering of sacrifice. And they offered all these bulls, all these sheep, tremendous offering unto the Lord, saying, Lord, you know, I, the talk's cheap. You know what God's looking for? He's not looking for the right words. He's looking for right action. He's looking for people that will say, you know, I'm going to put legs under my prayer. Now, we're going to have a prayer meeting tonight. We're going to pray for our nation. We're gonna, and all those churches that have covered in together, we're coming together tonight. And we're going to do it next Sunday night too. And what are we praying? We're not praying, oh, God, let my party win. No, we're going to pray, oh, God, we want you to win. Lord, we want, we want, Lord, we need a man in the White House that will honor, will, will reverence you. You know, the thing about that is, the, you know, and I get these, these 
people who know just enough Bible to be to reveal their ignorance. Uh, now you shouldn't judge, preacher. Well, you know the Bible says by their fruits you will know them. That's there too. And it's amazing how they lift that verse out of context. It, the Bible doesn't say don't make judgments. It says whatever, whatever standard you use, use it on yourself too, if you'll read it in context. And by their fruits, you will know them. And that's what I challenge you to do. The most important election in the lifetime of anybody here. By their fruits, you know them. We need a man who will reverence God. We'll, we, we need, listen, we need people in our community and in our churches, in our homes, that will, that will honor the life of the innocent. We do. We need people who will say, you know, life is a gift from God and I have no right to play God. If you'll read the context of these three chapters, what, what the old boy did, well, well, let's just get down to it right here. In verse 16, and he removed Maaka, the mother of Asa, the king, in other words, grandma. Oh, he touched grandma. Be careful. Don't worship grandma. Love grandma. There's people who worship grandma. That's called idolatry. And he said, the, from being queen mother, because she had made an obscene image of Ashtoreth. Uh, and we think killing unborn, unborn babies or new babies is something new. It's been around. The devil's had it around since the beginning. And it is devilish. And it is from hell. Stand up. Stand up for Jesus. Stand up. You know, we wanted to put in what Dr. Graham, that insert in the bulletin today. Do you realize, I, I was amazed. Dr. David Jeremiah, the pastor out in uh, San Diego, w went to visit Dr. Graham and, and uh, had a book, and it was dedicated to him and to Dr. Graham. And, and they sat down and, it was, and visited with him for a while and, and, uh, and, and Dr. Jeremiah left, and he called Franklin Graham, Billy's son, who's heading up uh, the Billy Graham Evangelist Association now. He says, you know, we need to have this in the newspapers across America. And he says, well, let me talk to Daddy, and I'll get back with you. And the next day, they talked on the phone, and he says, Dr. Jeremiah, Daddy said that's a good thing, and he wants you to handle it. <laughs> so Dr. Jeremiah has some people around him, and they, they went across, and they said, well, it will take $1 million, $1 million, to put it in the newspapers. You know, the, the main newspapers, especially in the swing states, that which is in your bulletin insert about Billy Graham, what he had to say. And uh, to make a long story short, Dr. Jeremiah made four phone calls over the next two days and had $2 million. You say, that's a miracle. Yeah, that, God believes in miracles. You need to, too. As a matter of fact, now they got $4 million. But the message is going to go out. And it's not a political message. It is a Christ-honoring, Bible-honoring message. Amen? God, help us. Help us to realize what we need. You see, King Asa realized that he needed to reverence God, and so do you. King Asa realized that he needed to honor innocent life, whether it's inside the womb or brand new born. Do you realize that... Uh, not only can they kill the baby before it's born, up until a week after it's born, they can kill it. Think that one through. How much like Hitler do we have to become until we realize how evil this is? How evil this is. 
And then he realized, Asa, the king, realized that, that family values are ultimately, I mean, they are absolutely important. Amen? Family values. And everybody says, oh, I'm for family values. Well, what's the Bible say about family values? One man, one woman. That's family values. That is family values. It's not one man and seven women. It's not one woman and three men. It's not one man and another man or another woman and another woman. It is one man, one woman. Why, is it, why do you think that's so vitally important? Because no other way works. It does not work. You know? Uh, the only way the other ways work is, you know, especially the, the, the man, man, woman, woman thing, is uh, you, you can't reproduce. You've got to recruit. You see? It uh, just... You can't improve on God's plan. A man and a woman. Amen? A man and a woman. And so, and here, King Asa realized that, you know, Grandma, I love you, but what you're doing doesn't honor God, and it's going to stop. And sometimes we, as people, Whatever influence or leadership you have in your immediate family and your extended family, sometimes you have to stand up and say, in love, this is right and this is wrong and this is where I'm going to stand and this is how we play ball. Amen? Why am I telling you this? Because you're going to see God honoring people lining up with him. I want to see America line up with God. How about you? Do you realize when this nation was formed, 98.6% of the people were professing Christians? I don't know about you, but that's a whole lot. That's overwhelming, overwhelming majority, 98.6. And there was 1.2% Jews. And then there was this pinch of a percent that were just plumb ignorant and pagan. And now yet we, t we, have, the, we have from our educational system to, I mean, all the media, they're telling us how pagan and secular and godless we've always been. And that's not true. But we are headed that way headlong. But I'm standing before you today telling you that We've not gone so far that we can't come back to him. And we can. You say, well, what do I do? You choose for you. I can't choose for anybody else. But I'm going to choose for you, for me. And you choose for you. That I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to line up with the word. I don't care... Your granddaddy was this, your great granddaddy was that, your great granddaddy was this, your great 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 daddy was that, and all that. I'm telling you, granddaddy's not here to live for you. You're here to live for you, and you need to line up with God. And the way things might have been a hundred years ago, it, they sure have come off a big 180 since then. And what something might have stood for back yonder don't necessarily stand for that right now. The only thing that doesn't change is God and His Word, and that's where we got to change. That's where we have to stand. Bless your heart. I really didn't want to. <laughs> the high places. You see, now, here's what Asa did. He didn't do a thorough job. Verse 17, but the high places were not removed from Israel. Nevertheless, the heart of Asa was loyal all his days. Uh, you've got to understand, Israel was above Judah. They, Judah had captured part of Israel, Ephraim, that's the next one up, you know, and, and, and parts of that right there, and, and they were having influence. But he didn't have influence all of, over all of the original place of Israel, you know, part of the rebels that, that took off. And now what does that tell me? 
however far God takes you, rejoice and be true. You see, here's what the devil will do. He will say, well, you took this much territory, but look at all that you've not even touched. Well, can I remind you that there's people coming after you that's going to build on the foundation that you leave behind? And that's why it's so vitally important that we have our children in Sunday school. We have our children in children's church. We have our children in, in the student ministry. We, we have our children in, in all the, because it, we've got to, we need all the help we can get. Now, we can't be mom and dad for you, but let me tell you, anybody wants to come alongside and help, to help me so into my children and my grandchildren and my brothers and my sisters, I'm going to rejoice because you know what? I'm only going to walk so far. Do you hear me? I can only go to the point that God says, that's it, boy. Come on up here. But there's got to be people coming along behind that we have poured into, that we have mentored, that we've encouraged, and that we have been so loving and liberal with the stuff God has entrusted to us to advance the kingdom that when it is time for us to go, people, people will love us and say, oh, my, and, you know, and I miss them. And you ought to. My dad went to heaven July the 11th, 1985, and I still miss him. To this very day. But I'm telling you, I know I'm going to see him again. And we're going to just have a rip snorting time. He's going to get the guitar and I'm going to get the mandolin and we're just going to sit down and pick one for Jesus. That's what we're going to do. We're just going to have a good old time. But I'm not there yet. I'm here yet. You're not over yonder that you're here. And as long as God gives you breath, you've got something to do. You've got things to do, and you know, and your, your health might fail and your, your body might wither. But as long as you've got breath, you can pray, you can read the word and, and people that come to see you, you can encourage. Don't be a poison sower. Be a truth teller. Knowing that, well, daddy or mom, bless God, I'm the testimony of what you poured in. And I'm going to stand on that and grandma and grandpa's underneath there. And it goes all the way back at family tree, all the way back to where somebody heard the apostle Paul say, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And knowing that our children and our grandchildren are coming after us. And when the time comes, they're going to stand on the foundation we leave behind. You see, that's why America is going awry. We have forgotten from whence we came. We have believed the lies that the secularists, the humanists, the atheists that have hijacked our, most of our uh, schools of higher learning and our education system, and you open up a history book today, if it has anything in there about the pilgrims, it'll say they were dissenters. Well, what are they dissenting? The, the Vietnam War? I mean, so vague and so minor that, that if they have anything to say about Christopher Columbus, they'll tell you what an evil man he was. Not the fact that the argument that swayed Queen Isabella was, let us take the gospel to those peoples who've never heard of Jesus. That's what turned her heart and opened her pocketbook to fund his trip. But you'll not find that today. Oh, friends, America has forgotten Who's going before us?
and the foundations and the, and the good fight of faith. We have forgotten about the Francis Asbury's and the Thomas Cokes. And, and, and we, we have forgotten uh, about these pioneers who preached the gospel, who came, the David Brainerds of this world, who, who came at the beginning the Roger Williamses, and they've come to, to preach Jesus and to proclaim the truth. That's who populated this nation. Oh, yeah, there were some entrepreneurs that were just after, after wealth, but the overwhelming majority of the people who came and settled and, and cleared land and built homes were people who wanted to glorify God. That's our foundation. That's our foundation. It's amazing to me. There's 56 signers of the Declaration of Independence, and you ask the average student today, you ask the average American today, name me some of them. They'll all say uh, Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin. Now, I wonder why our secular education system has made it a point to make sure everybody knows who those two were, but not the others, because those two were the honoriest. Do you hear me? In their personal lives, they were the honoriest. But they'll not tell you that 27 or 24 or 27, I can't remember, were ordained clergy, had seminary degrees. You can't tell me that this document, this Declaration of Independence and, and this, this Constitution of the United States, it is founded upon biblical principle from A to Z. And it's only over the last hundred years have we been turned from the truth and embraced a progressive, liberal, secular, socialist, atheistic worldview. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, all you have to do is read the blessed book. The people of God were prone to wonder. We're prone to go out on our own and do our own thing and get, and, and, you know, and pout and whine and gripe and complain. And, and I'm telling you, over uh, since Christy and I got back from Cuba, if anybody had a right, had a right humanly speaking, to whine, gripe, and complain, it's me. Because I, I tell you, I have suffered more in my physical body than I've ever suffered in my life. But I'm telling you, the Lord has sustained me. And I'm claiming everything he's got for me. And I don't know what it is going on. But I tell you, uh, that there was some victory gotten this morning in the prayer meeting over in the garage. Uh, one brother started praying for me in Spanish. And I only have, I understood half of what he was saying. But all of a sudden, I got hotter than a Saturday night special. Being fired seven times, I mean, seven times. How many times they'll fire? And I thought, oh, my goodness, I'm going to. And, and the next thing, I, I mean, I've been over double. And, I mean, I felt like my blood pressure would, must have really been up because I, I started sweating and carrying on and beating up. And, I mean, I thought, am I going to get sick or am I going to die? And the next thing I know, I'm sitting in a chair. And where the chair come from, I don't know. I got an idea. And I sure thought. Thank the Lord that that chair was there because I was going down on the ground. My Lord has plans for me. And I'm going to walk out his plan. And we're going to see, we're going to see Greenway blossom like a rose in the middle of the desert. And we're going to see people grow. And we're going to see lost people saved. And we're going to see sick people healed. I don't have time to feel sorry for me. I, I got plenty of time to do that in heaven. And when I get to heaven, that'll be the least of all I'm thinking about. Can anybody say amen? amen. Ask yourself this. Lord, do I reverence you as I should? Show me, Lord in my personal walk, in my conversation, in my time in your word, in my time in prayer, in my resources, in my tithes and my offerings, in my support, in my, in my bringing unity to the body. 
Do you pray for your, those of you that come 930 to the life group, Bible study, Sunday school, do you pray for your teacher like you should? I'm telling you, they need your prayer. They need you. They need you to bathe them in prayer. I need you to bathe me in prayer. And their spouses. And the Lord knows, boy, my wife really needs prayer. She's got to live with me. Uh, let's go over on this side. <laughs> but lastly, and that's this. The people of God have a responsibility to Israel. We do. We must reverence God. We must reverence innocent life. We must reverence traditional family values. We must reverence, we must honor Israel because God says, I'll bless those who bless Israel and I'll curse those who curse Israel. Now, you know, do I agree with everything Israel may or may not do? That's not the question. You know, I'm not, number one, I'm not an Israeli. I don't vote over there. You know, I don't live there. I, I'm not in their military, their IDF or their whatever else they got, their intelligence agencies. There's nothing like that. Because I'm a Christian, I pray for the peace of Jerusalem. I pray for the people of God, chosen people of God, Israel. And just as Paul's prayer was, my, my desire is that Israel be saved. That's my desire. That they come to the Messiah. And until then, Lord, you preserve them as a people as you have promised. You see, he foretold he was going to bring them back together. And from 1948, from the moment they were together, they are outnumbered 30 to 1. And there's been so many, so many times they've been tried to be destroyed. And God miraculously, miraculously beat back the Muslim hordes to where those people could survive and be alive today. For America, for the church, for my government, local and state and federal. Lord, I want somebody. Lord, I need some. Lord, send someone who will reverence you. Someone who will honor the sanctity of life. Someone who will honor and promote and defend traditional family values and someone who will stand with your chosen people, Israel. You want America to turn around? Do you want some of those 23 million people that are out of work or, or grossly underemployed to prosper? Do, do you want... Do you want the Holocaust that is happening in the wombs of American women stopped? Do you realize, uh, and, and, and please understand what I'm, I'm getting ready to say. I'm saying it because it's a shame and a tragedy and my heart breaks. But you realize that, uh, and this is not a slam on any group. It was shocking to me when I first realized that 40% of all African-American babies conceived are murdered through abortion. 40%. And I thought, Lord, why, why is this ethnic group so cursed? Why? why? I don't understand. And, and then I look back to the person who started this thing called, and it's a misnomer, this name is so deceiving, Planned Parenthood. Her name was Margaret Sanger. And she was a lot of things, but you know what she was more than anything? She was a bigoted racist who hated African-American people. And she is the one who said, you know, we need to get abortion legal so we can keep that inferior race under control. 
And I just wonder, and, 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 and they are not inferior, by the way, how many Booker T. Washingtons have been destroyed in their mother's womb? How many? How many more Martin Luther Kings? How many? How many Condoleezza Rices? How many Clarence Thomases? How many? Heaven will reveal. Heaven will reveal. I want to see America rescued. I want to see Virginia rescued. I want to see Winchester, Frederick County rescued. I want to see Greenway rescued. I want to see your home rescued. What am I going to do about it? That's entirely up to you. Let's stand. Father in heaven, have your will in our hearts and our lives. Lord, we, we, we as a nation, we as a church need you now more than ever. We need you now more than ever. But some of us are, Lord, too many of us are blind and indifferent. We are apathetic. We are unavailable and we are uncaring. Show us our sin that we can confess it and turn from it. And I pray, Lord, if there's any lost people in this house, help them to know that Jesus came and died on that cross of Calvary nearly 2,000 years ago, more than 2,000 years ago, to pay for their sin. That if they'll come and accept the free gift of eternal life, they can have it if they'll but humble their heart and ask. Have your way in our lives, dear Jesus. And Lord, may patriotic Americans, may godly Christians fill this altar for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.